Welcome, friends, to Compass Online. We are so glad to have you join us from wherever you may be. You know, in a little bit, we are going to be taking communion together as a church family. So go ahead and look around you for elements that you can use. And as we head into this time of worship, as we are preparing our hearts for worship, let us meditate on the words of Ephesians 3, 18, which says, may you have the power to understand as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is his love for us. Let's sing together. As we get ready to take communion together, I'm reminded that there are two types of people in this world. 
There are the gut thinkers and there are the analytical thinkers. I'm an analytical thinker and I'm always jealous of people that just have this gut sense of what they should do and when they should do that. Because me, I'm the type of guy that puts together a cost benefit analysis every time I want to just go to Target, right? I like to plan out in advance and then execute on a plan. But here's the thing that I'm reminded of. Every single one of us can fall into both of those camps. And I'm reminded as we are getting ready to take communion together that there's a verse that helps us as analytical thinkers understand better what we should be doing as we get ready to take communion. And it's found in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 40. It says that we need to examine our ways and test them and then return to the Lord. Did you catch that? There are three things in that verse that we should be doing as we get ready to take communion together. Let's be mindful of all of them. We need to examine our ways and test them. What are the things in our life that we have fallen short of God's perfect standard on? As we get ready to take communion, we are told to confess our sins. We don't want there to be things in our life that keep us from remembering Jesus' sacrifice for us. So as we're getting ready to take communion, let's take a few moments right now to examine our ways and test them so that we can confess and be ready to take communion together. And the verse concludes with saying, and let us return to the Lord. Let's do that now through taking communion together to remember the person and the work of Jesus Christ. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said that this is my body and it's given for you. As often as you take this, do it in remembrance of me. Let's take together. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup represents a new covenant in my blood. And this blood has been shed for you. Jesus's work on the cross is his blood shed for each of us who have trusted in him. As often as you do this, let's do it in remembrance of Jesus. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for the work that you have done for each and every one of us. God, we're grateful for the reminders, even before Jesus, of things that could foreshadow taking communion together, taking the time to realize that we are sinners and imperfect people in need of a perfect Savior. May the reflections of our heart ultimately draw us to return to you, Jesus. We are grateful for everything you have done for us. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Welcome back to our series called Jackpot, Exploring Blessings, Outrageous, a windfall of blessings found in our relationship with Christ as described in Romans chapter 5. This is the fourth, the last week of this four-week series. And so first I want to say hi. Hi to everybody who's at our Three Rivers campus. I'm thinking of all you people. Everybody at Bolingbrook, South Naperville folks, Naperville, Wheaton, online friends, grateful for you too. Let's, let's talk, shall we? Today I'm doing some kind of interesting. I, I was a biology major. You, you may be aware of that. I've mentioned a number of times that I aspired to be a doctor and it wasn't until my senior year in college that God said, nope, Jeff, I've got ministry calling on your life. And so I spent a lot of years studying biology, and part of my biology studies was doing dissections. 
Friends, I uh, spent a lot of time in the lab doing dissections, and I'm going to do something I've never done before. I'm going to start my sermon by performing a dissection. How about that? That sounds like fun, huh? You know, it's interesting. Back when I was a biology major, uh, two of my roommates, they were also pre-med students, and during my senior year, they did a trick. They were given the responsibility to... Uh, show the freshman class a cadaver. Do you know what a cadaver is? A cadaver is a human body that we would dissect. And uh, boy, that can be a little traumatic at your freshman year, your first time seeing the cadaver. Well, my two buddies who were responsible for this, they pulled a, a gag. What they did is one of them got on the table and they covered him with the towels. And then the freshman came in and my buddy who was conducting the class, he said, this will be traumatic, you know, I'm going to pull back the towels in just a moment to expose the cadaver. Are you all ready? And these nervous freshmen were freaking. When he pulled back the towel, here it was my buddy who sat up and went, you know, that was a class they'd never forget. Uh, Yeah, well, friends, that said, let's dive in. You may wonder, what are you planning to dissect in this sermon? Well, let's find out, shall we? We're going to dissect a flower. How about that? Some of you are like ready to pass out. Yeah, I know. Flower, you can handle that. Have you ever dissected a flower before? Friends, flowers are so beautiful. And not only are they beautiful, they're also uh, fascinating and powerful. What I'm going to do first is cut off the stem. We'll put the stem right there. And now I'm going to remove the petals. You know, the petals are such an important part of the flower. They provide, well, the attraction that brings the bees in for a look to see what's happening. Petals also provide protection for the reproductive organs of the flower that are inside. All right, and then once we look on the inside of the flower, we've got some parts here called the stamen. The stamen are also called the uh, male organs of the flower, and uh, this particular flower has got six stamen. We'll, We'll put those there. The stamen are composed of two parts, really. You've got the filament, which is the long band, and then you've got the anther, which is the top part that contains all of the pollen, which are obviously necessary to create a new plant. Well, after you remove the stamen, you have the pistil. And the pistil is the female part of the flower. And we have three parts. We have the stigma, the style, and then they call this the ovary. It's actually the part that will eventually ripen into a fruit. Well, there, friends, now we have dissected a flower. What do you think? Is it beautiful? You know, it's interesting. Dissection helps us understand the parts better, but arguably dissection destroys the beauty. You know, you look at all those parts and you're like, oh man, the flower and all of its glory seems to be removed. Well, I feel like I'm in danger of dissecting the most beautiful thing in the world in this particular sermon. Friends, we're about to study the love of God. There is nothing as beautiful as the passionate affection of God for you and for me. And we're going to analyze it in this sermon. We're going to break it down into parts and look at each part. And I have this fear that in the analysis of love, we'll understand the parts well, but destroy the holistic beauty that the love should have. And so I'm begging God in prayer, and I'll ask you to try to focus on this as well. Yes, we're going to analyze love and break it down, but let's try to hold together. May the understanding of the parts help us appreciate the beauty of the whole. That's what we're going for. Are you ready to study the love of God? Friends, just as a review in this series, so far we've looked at, well, peace came first, the peace of God. Remember, we went from being enemies of God to reconciled with him and being his friends. That's peace with God. 
And then we looked at grace, the, the land of grace. We've been given access into the land of grace, and we have God's undeserved favor shining on us at all times. And then last week we looked at hope. We look forward with confident expectation to heaven and the glory of God revealed to us there and actually his beauty rubbing off on us there as well. We are excited about the future. And now we come to the grand topic of the love of God. And friends, we're going to be looking actually at four verses in Romans 5. Allow me to read them to you now. These are, we're starting at verse 5 through verse 8. It says, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a really good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love, his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, may we be powerfully moved by our understanding of the scandalous, the shocking, the beautiful love of God. Not sure where you're connecting here from, but friends, together, let's study the love of God and see if God doesn't change our lives with our understanding. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 5, that, that first phrase, God, God's love has been poured into our hearts. Friends, we're going to go after an experience of the love of God that is so powerful it can change our lives. And uh, to do so, we're going to dissect the love. Are you ready to dissect God's love? I'm actually going to offer six Six different essentials that have to be true if you're going to have this amazing encounter with the love of God for you. Okay, we're really breaking it down. And again, I hope that we can put together the pieces and see it as one. But here's what they are. The, the first is the first essential is existence of the love of God. The love of God has to exist. And I simply highlight God's love. In that verse, you know, the verse just says, hey, it's true. There is this thing called the love of God. The maker of the universe loves you. And that's shocking, but it's got to start there. You know, if, if anyone's going to experience the love of God, we, we've got to begin with the fact that it's true. It exists. The love of God is a thing. The maker is not angry with you. The, the, the maker has a disposition that is favorable towards you. In fact, he doesn't just like you. He loves you. But here's the thing about the existence of the love of God. Sadly, the love of God for you can exist and go no further, meaning there's no connection to it, which is tragic. It reminds me of the rom-com movie, one of the common tropes is that a uh, best friends, you know, fall in love. But their love, you know, they don't realize the other one loves them too, you know, because they've been good friends for so long. And so it's a, it's a secret love that they, they hide. Well, you, the, you as the movie watcher, you know that they both love each other. And the fact that they're hiding it from each other, assuming the other doesn't feel the same way, drives you crazy. Hidden, undiscovered love is a tension that is maddening that those movies, you know, really play on. Well, so it is so often, most of the time, with God's love. He loves, but there's no knowledge of the fact that he loves, no experience of his love. And so it stops right there with the step of existence can't be. So let's move on, shall we? From existence, the love of God must exist. Secondly, evidence, the love of God must be proven in action. Here, I'm going to jump down to uh, verse 8. I am bouncing around a little. I hope you're okay with that. But verse 8 says this, God demonstrates his love for us in this, while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. The love of God demonstrated, proven in action, the death of Christ on the cross for the sins of a undeserving people. It is proof, evidence of an incredible love. Friends, when we look at the cross, we see many things. But one of the main things we see is the love of God. It's true. You wouldn't, he wouldn't die for us if he didn't love us. Evidence. You know, it reminds me of when my wife and I, <clears throat> so we had one of those relationships that started off as just friendship. Unfortunately, it, it morphed into more on my side and not hers. I started to secretly adore her. I was in love with her. She just viewed me as a great friend. Well, because of that, I had to really crank down on the secret and not let her know my true feelings, lest I scare her away. But my true feelings came out one day when a group of friends, we were walking along on a winter day and there was this precipitous slope on the side of the path and Jen got too close and she slept and in the snow went tumbling head over heels down this hill. Well, I didn't think, I reacted. And I went, Jah! and I started bounding down this hill. All the rest of the friends just standing and watching. As I dive down and scoop her up, are you okay? And then I realized, oh boy, secret's out. Action has betrayed my affection. I looked up at my friends and they were all going, oh, we see, see how that is? When love is real, it's born in action and evidenced in action. And so it is with the cross of Christ in our desperate sin. Jesus came bounding out of heaven into earth to give himself to rescue us. If that isn't proof of love. I don't know what is. So the love has got to exist. The love's got to be evidenced. And the next emphasis, this is something I didn't expect to find in the verse. But as we go back to verse 8, I notice something. It says, God demonstrates. I want to highlight that now. Uh, demonstrates is in the present tense. God presently is demonstrating his love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died, past tense. I would have thought it would have said, God demonstrated, past tense, his love through the past tense death of Christ. But it says, no, today God is demonstrating still. God is active, highlighting the cross of Christ as an evidence of his love. In fact, the word I have is emphasis. God is emphasizing. He's, he's trying to highlight, uh, show a spotlight. In fact, uh, this is interesting. The Greek word is synistomy, which I found means to draw attention to, to position someone with a good view of something, or to put a frame around something. This is God actively trying to help us see how the cross speaks of his love. Interestingly, when we had a debrief with our staff regarding our Good Friday services, one of the takeaways in that debrief is, in the future, we've got to make sure there's a spotlight on the cross. The, the cross, you know, we had nailed our sins to the cross if you participated. And it, it just, you need a spotlight on it. You need to help people see it. And that's what God is doing. God is active today trying to get us to see the evidence for his love. He's emphasizing, highlighting, spotlighting the love of God. Isn't that fascinating? God didn't, you know, have Christ die on the cross for us and then just sit back and actively and say, that should do it. No, still today, he is active trying to show us his love. You know, beyond the cross, the cross is the greatest expression of the love of Christ. But even in the Old Testament, God was trying to spotlight, emphasize the, the love he has for us. This is interesting. He used various metaphors in the Old Testament. One of them is romance. It says in Isaiah 62, 5, as a groom rejoices over his bride, so God rejoices over you. 
God says, you know romantic love, right? When your heart pitter-patters at the sound of their voice or the smell of their perfume or the, the view of their writing, you know, young marital love. God's like, yeah, that's how I feel about you. Wow. God uses the metaphor of parenting. In Psalm 103, verse 13, it says, as a father loves his children, so the Lord loves you. God's like highlighting it through parenting. He's like, come on, parents, you, you know what it's like to see your first child born where suddenly this new affection is born in you that you, have, you never knew was possible. You die for that kid. God's like, that's how I feel about you. Or the imagery of ownership of something really valuable. It's, it says in Exodus 19, 5, God says, you are my priceless treasure. You know, that thing that's so valuable to you, God says, you're that thing to me. Or God uses, for the science-minded, uh, astronomy. And in Psalm 103, verse 11, God's love for you is as great as the distant stars are above the earth. In all of these metaphors, God's just trying to say, it's huge, man, I'm telling you, the burning affection in me for you this is God actively trying to emphasize and convey to us about his love. And I suppose the next question is, do you believe it? You know, God can, it can exist and he can demonstrate it in the cross and emphasize it by highlighting it. But now we're to, do you believe it? The, the point I want to make here is examination. We must examine the, the facts and conclude. What do we think? What do we think? And even in this section of, of Romans 5, Paul is imagining us thinking about this notion that though I'm a sinner, God loves me. In fact, in that examination, he, he admits that it's kind of crazy. Verse 7 says this, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. Though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Do you see what Paul's doing? He's like, people think about it with me. Think about it. I know it's far-fetched. We are not inclined to die for even a good person or maybe a really good person. We'd, he's saying, you know, when we compare to our human experience, this notion of God loving us so much that he would die for those unworthy seems crazy. But Paul's like, I know, but think about it. And I pray you'll come to realize that it's true. The cross proves it's true. And so in this examination, what is your conclusion? Do you believe? And right now, as you imagine the emotional heart of God towards you, do you believe he's got love for you? That his heart bursts with tender affection. What is your conclusion? Now, I hope you've become convinced that it's true. God does love me. But that's not enough, is it? To believe that the love exists, as God loves me, that's a huge step, but it's not enough. This verse wants us to experience it, and so we've got to go further. The, after examination, and hopefully belief in that love, we've got to go now to expression. God wants to express his love in a way that you can feel it. We're, we're going back to verse 5 now. Remember what it said? God's love has been poured out. The, the love of God, he, he's not content to let it be an emotion in him. He must pour it out, you know, pouring it out. Imagine this is the love of God. To pour it out, is a, it's an example of God desiring to express to us his love, expression. I remember the, the prodigal son uh, in that wonderful parable when the son who had been wayward finally comes home to the father. The father doesn't just feel love. It says that he looks out and sees the son a long way off on the walkway towards his house. And the father expresses it, runs to the son, hugs him and kisses him and puts sandals on his feet and a ring on his finger and a robe on his shoulders. And the father says, kill the vet and calf. We're going to party. All these expressions of love. To have it in the heart is a good thing. But God says, I want to pour it out on you. Well, 
God pours out his love, but we must receive it. And so uh, here, the, the sixth point is experience. It's not enough for God to show it. We must experience it. And we see that in the verse where it says, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. You know, if, if this is our heart, all right, and if God's trying to pour the love into our heart, but we're not receiving it, the, the, the objective of God is incomplete. What God wants is our hearts to experience, to receive, to capture his love being poured in. Friends, this is experiential language. Sometimes Christians get unnerved about experience language. Sometimes Christians say, I don't need feelings. I just need to know that it's so. I want to study the facts and have a knowledge of the love of God. Yes, so do I. But God wants more than just head knowledge. He wants us to encounter him and feel the dynamic of his love being poured into our hearts. The Christian life is experiential. Yes, there's truth and cognitive study, but then it's to move beyond to where we feel loved. And this verse so beautifully expresses that. You know, if I could point to just a couple others uh, that relate. 2 Thessalonians 3, 5 says, May God direct your heart into his love. Don't you see that? Here, here's, here's the love of God being poured out. And that verse says, no, God, may God direct your heart right to where God's pouring it out so that we can experience it. May, may God direct your heart. May you pursue the encounter with the love of God. May you find five minutes in the car and just say, hey, Lord, can we have some time together? I, I, I want to encounter you. I want to declare my love to you. But my heart needs to experience, not just be reminded up here, but experience down here an outpouring of your love for me. Friends, those who prioritize leaning into mental focus and biblical truth, leaning into an experience of God's love, that's what it means to have your heart directed into the love of God. Here's another verse. Jude 1, 21 says, keep yourself in God's love. Isn't that beautiful? You may have an experience, but then don't let your heart wander. Stay there. Stay in the outpouring of his love. Keep it there. So that you can have this perpetual, as much as God enables, a perpetual awareness of his outpouring affection for you. This is the power of a life filled with joy, the love of God. Going back to verse 5, just one more time, I do want to point this out. It says that God's love may be poured into our hearts through what? Through the Holy Spirit. This is important. Because the, the power that makes someone experience the love of God, that is the Holy Spirit. This is really important because some people say, I'm just not that type of person. I know there are people who are really emotional and they find they can connect with God's love. I'm just not that type. Or they may say, that's not, not my upbringing. I have a home of origin where my earthly father was absent. And because I don't know the love of an earthly father, I'll never really be able to connect with the love of the heavenly father. Listen, no excuses. This is not dependent on your family of origin or your personality bent. This is dependent upon the work of the Holy Spirit. If you say, I can't experience the love of God like this, not me. What you're essentially saying is the Holy Spirit is weak. He's incapable of doing what he says in this verse. He can do. The fact that this encounter with the love of God depends on the power of the Holy Spirit tells us that this is an option. It's accessible to everybody because it's not dependent on you. It's dependent on the Spirit's power. Good news, friends. And so may we not just 
know that God loves us, but experience it. Let's look at these five points again, shall we? We've got the existence of the love of God. It's got to be true. That's the first step, that he loves you. Number two, evidence of it. The cross of Christ is the number one evidence that God loves us. The emphasis, God must actively today work to highlight, to emphasize that the cross and the metaphors of the Old Testament speak of his love. Examination. We must take a look at the evidence and make a conclusion. What do we think? Do we believe that he loves us? Expression. It's not enough to be believing up here. God wants to show in tangible encounter. He wants us to feel that love. So that's God expressing it. And then lastly, we need to experience it to, with his help, direct our hearts into the outpouring of his love and keep it there. That's the great privilege of every Christian. You know, with my kids, uh, I'll, I'll frequently say, hey, don't leave, you know, when they're leaving the house. I go, don't leave without a hug. I need a hug. And they'll roll their eyes, dad. And they'll come over and I'll wrap my arms around them and I'm awkwardly long, you know. And they'll squirm a little bit and they're like, let me go. And I'm like, hey, do you know I love you? No, I know you love me, dad. All right. And I let them go. Uh, we need that with God. We may squirm a little bit, you know, pressing into the presence of God and, and connecting with his love may be like, oh, this is kind of weird. But we need it. Uh, the kids don't think they need to know of my love, but they do. And sometimes we don't think, I don't need to experience God hugging me. I'm cool. We're good. You, know, you need it more than you realize. So don't walk past your heavenly father without getting the hug, without experiencing the outpouring of his love straight into your heart. Will you pray with me? Lord, I'm praying for my friends. I, I, I know that none of us have experienced the joy of being loved by you as much as we should. Maybe some, never before, have they felt the outpouring of God's love. Others of us have, but man, we're not living in it like we should. Help us grab these verses. Help us practice pressing into your presence. Help us claim the truth that they proclaim. And Lord, may your love become the sweet fuel that drives us every day. We pray this in Christ's name.
thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We hope that you have loved this sermon series on Jackpot, understanding more and more just the great benefits that come from knowing and trusting Jesus. Before you go, take a moment, fill out your online connection card and let us know you've been here and how we can be praying for you. And I also want to just take a moment to say thank you to all of you who give financially here at the Compass Church. Your giving makes a difference here, near, and far, letting people continually hear the good news of how much Jesus loves them. And lastly, I want to remind you that coming up next week is kind of a big deal. So you now have zero excuse not to know about it. Are you ready? Next Sunday is Mother's Day. What are you going to do for your mom? How are you going to make her feel special? Ultimately, I want to give you a couple of ideas. One, your mom wants you to go to church with her. I promise you that's the case. Number two, your mom does not want to have to clean up her own house. So spend some time and do something lovingly serving your mom this week. And number three, make sure you invite her to join you in creating some memories together. Whether that's inside her church building or outside of it, spend some intentional time with the moms and spiritual moms in your life because we're gonna look forward to celebrating them the next time we're together here at Compass Online.